Keep it quiet for rehearsal, please. Right, Nova. Shh. Keep quiet. Boys, keep it quiet. All the noise now, please. Here we go. Get ready. Action. This film is a very big film indeed. It's what they call a roadshow film. It will be shown for long runs in theatres all over the world. Action! The only thing about David Lean was what he asked for, he got. I came here because we wanted a wild place. I said, okay, fine, sure, I surrender, I'll do it. He did his own cooking, which was fine for me, but I'd have to do the wash-up in the morning. The advice was ignored, you do not put a curric in there. But they did. It was two pounds a day. It was quite a nice pay packet to be getting at the end of the week. They came and veni vidi vici, I suppose. Dingle was little Hollywood. When I was trying to find out what was happening, I was told they were going to do a bit of a film here in Dingle. Nineteen sixty eight was an extraordinary year. Fury at the Vietnam War sparked protests and demonstrations across the globe. The American civil rights campaigner, Martin Luther King, was shot and killed in Memphis. New York Senator Robert Kennedy was shot and killed in LA. Hippies at the height of flower power extended free love to all. At home, the Northern Ireland civil rights movement made world headlines following an RUC baton charge in Derry. On the Dingle Peninsula, things were a little quieter. It was dead. It was in the last throes of death. There was, there was no place to turn. To put it bluntly, money. I mean, I can put my hand in my pocket and I can pull out a five or a tenner. I mean, there were people in Dingle that time and if they handled Ten pounds in a whole year. Now they might say to you, "Ah, Tom, you're wrong." I can show to them in books the takings that we had in the shop. The money just wasn't there, but there was nothing dishonest. Dingle was like a trading post. The staple diet, when I was growing up anyways, would be uh, salted mackerel and um, floury potatoes and uh, maybe a drop of launacht or fresh milk straight from the cow. Think it was a one-horse town really. There was nothing in it. You had the farmers and you had the fishing. Only for the fishing the people would have died. A gallon of milk in the creamery that time was one shilling and three pence. A pint was one and three. A package of woodbines was one and three. A grey crow, if you could catch one, to kill and uh, bring to the barrack, was one and three. So the more grey crows you had, the more porter you had. A fox's tail was five, was uh, ten shillings. Nutter skin was five pounds. All those things, the hunting went on. There were no restaurants or anything at that stage. Just the bars, 52 pubs. That was it, so there was plenty of drink there all the time. There was uh, probably only one tractor in the parish, and there was uh, maybe one or two cars and maybe one or two telephones. There was no television, and, and there was uh, only a couple of transistor radios. We have just uh, evolved, I suppose, from uh, the time that we were using the, the wet and dry batteries to crank up the radios. The corners then were full of boys every um, Saturday and Sunday evening. And bit by bit you could see the different generations doing Every year 
um, the 16, 17, 18 year olds disappeared. They immigrated. And we were lucky enough that um, we weren't among them. But life on the peninsula was about to change forever. And the impetus for that change came from a rather unexpected source. By 1968, British director David Lean was a veteran of 14 feature films. They included The Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago. To write his next project, Lean hired the Oscar-winning playwright and screenwriter on both Lawrence and Zhivago. Well, the story of this film is a love story. And it is a love story really for the purely personal reason that after um, Zhivago and Lawrence of Arabia, uh, David and I both felt that we'd had enough of large epic themes and would like to tackle the most intimate kind of theme, which is, of course, a love story. We did want to say that however isolated your community, however safe you feel in your, your little lair, with your friends and your relations, sooner or later the finger of great events will reach out and touch you. The story is based on Flaubert's Madame Bovary and set in the fictional village of Kirri in the west of Ireland. The central character is Rosie Ryan, a spoilt and bored young woman longing for love. Her marriage to schoolteacher Charles Shaughnessy disappoints her. When she discovers passion in the arms of a British officer on leave from the front, it brings inevitable tragedy. The story to start really was written between January and the end of September last year. And before Robert Bolt and David Lean had finished working on the script, which they did together throughout the whole period, I came out here in August with six other people we divided them into two units, one unit which went north of Galway and one unit which went south of Galway, looking for the various locations for which the story called. I should think we must have taken something like 30 to 40,000 photographs. Every beach, every promontory, every likely area for the village was covered. And then, at the end of September, the film wasn't finished, the writing of it, but we had to make David and Robert come over to Ireland in order to finish the writing here, so at the same time they could look at photographs of the various places that had been researched and begin to make a decision as to where we were finally going to settle. I came here because we wanted a wild place. And I like wild places. And I think this west coast of Ireland is one of the most beautiful wild places I've ever seen. When the final locations were chosen, it was time to call in the locals. John Moore was an auctioneer in Dingle and a man with connections. My introduction to Ryan's daughter was when the Rolls Royce pulled up outside my father's office in September of 1968. And you wouldn't see too many Rolls Royces in Dingle at that time. And this chappy got out and came into the office, introduced himself as Eddie Fowley. We were told the purpose of his visit, which was to be treated with confidence at that particular time. He wanted us to line up accommodation for the stars and the principals of the film company. Also to help in securing leases on the various locations which they would require. This, needless to say, was duly agreed. Well, I suppose you can say money talks. And he also wanted an introduction to a supplier of timber, cement, etc. 
told me that he wanted an order of, I quite clearly remember it, 300 two by two stakes, three foot long, pointed at one end. And he wanted them tomorrow morning, seven o'clock, back in Dunqueen. I said, forget it. I was worried about not getting paid for it and all that. When I was trying to find out what was happening, I was told by Paddy Baker, my man back in the mill, Tommy said, you better take that order and look after it. Because he said, there's something big happening. I heard they were going to do a bit of a film here in Dingle. And he said, that could be it. <laughs> Even from the very beginning, we were, you know, there was talks around that there was a film crew around and there was a film going to be made in Dunquin and that kind of thing. And then, like, when they started constructing the village, yes, we knew. We knew what was going on. We worked for the whole winter up there. And that winter we had snow. It was a terrible place to work because you were up on top of a mountain and it was always foggy and damp there. They put up the canteens first of all, and the offices. Then they started to dig the foundations for the village itself. Because an awful lot of the houses, the pub, the shop, the guard station, all those houses were properly built and on proper foundations. The only thing that was fiberglass in the village was the church. It was a completely fiberglass job. The school was properly built, and most of the houses had all their fronts and their gables properly built. During that winter, up to 200 local men were employed in the building of the village. The work was overseen by film company boss Mike Nugent. Chinese Mikkel Osurovar, he was the island violinist, beautiful musician. Chinese was putting a bag around a concrete block and lifting it onto the trailer and then kind of emptying it out of the bag onto the trailer. And Mike said, stop, 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 says Mike to me. He got out of the van and he said, what are you doing? And Chinese says, I'll put the block in the bag, he says. And why, he says, my, the merenta, the merenta, he says, the fingers. The violin, the violin, you know, he was trying to explain to Mike. And Mike said, get in there. So poor Shanian thought he was going to be sacked. And up he brought him up to the hill. And he put him in charge of the sweep in the offices, doing very little. And he had, his fingers were intact. I thought it was wonderful. As work neared completion on Kaharu, the site chosen for the fictional village of Kiruri, the star started to arrive early in 1969. Lean had chosen a stellar cast. We've got a very interesting and a very varied cast. Robert Mitchum playing a part quite unlike the kind of part he normally plays. Trevor Howard also playing the kind of part very different from the last part that he played in the Charge of the Light Brigade, Sarah Miles, whose first really big opportunity this is, Christopher Jones, who's a new young American actor, Johnny Mills, who you know, Leo McKern, this great character actor, and a large number of very distinguished Irish actors and actresses. In fact, if we're still shooting this film in September, which I think we will be, I think we're going to make a very serious dent in the Dublin Theatre Festival. I came home one night and uh, my wife told me that Mr. Bolt had called. And I just looked at her and she said that we chatted. And I looked at her again and she said, no blandishments. So she said, I told him that we, he, you would call him back tomorrow. And I said, well, you told him wrong because I'm not about to call him back tomorrow. And she said, well, we anticipated that, so he's calling you back. So Bobby got on the phone, and first, you know, there was hello, London, Mr. Mitchum, Mr. Robert Mitchum, you know, London, England, calling Mr. Robert, and all, on and on and on. So finally, we got that established. Um, I said, okay, fine, sure, I surrender, I'll do it. You know, and he thought it was static on the line. He had no idea what I was talking about. So uh, he said, is it the extended uh, tenure of employment, you know, the term they said that you find off-putting he said because we looking through the schedule we found all sorts of places where you can be where you're totally free you can be off for 
three weeks, ten days, minutes, he meant. And I said, no, it's not that at all. He said, but no bother to anyone, you can be awful. And I said, no, it's not that at all. And he said, well, then I said, I had planned suicide. And he started jiggling the, huh, what? And I said, I planned to kill myself, no further questions, no more interviews, no more phone calls. Right? Right. He said, I see, yes. I said, you understand that? And he said, perfectly. But uh, he said, if you would do this film of ours first, he said, and then do yourself in. He said, I'd be happy to stand the expense of your burial. And so there goes a year of my uh, well-planned, well-ordered life. Cast against type to play the role of the hapless schoolmaster, Robert Mitchum needed accommodation in Dingle. His preference was for somewhere quiet, a little outside the town. There came a knock on Margaret Sheehy's door. They were looking for houses for the stars, so they kept on and on to know we keep somebody. I said no, we wouldn't, because I was doing bed and breakfast at the time. So I was there one morning, and this woman came in the door, and she just breezed around the house and she, oh, he would love that range and he went upstairs and then she was gone. So I got a phone call after I said it was Robert Mitchum's secretary. So we went back anyway and I told him, okay. He came in February. Big wide shoulders. He didn't walk, he swaggered, you know, in the hall. And he said, so, you Margaret, you're my landlady? I said, yes. I used to go every day, clean the house and, you know, do a couple of jobs. I never cooked for him. He did his own cooking, which was fine for me, but I'd have to do the wash up in the morning. That winter, the cold spell lasted well into the new year. It was bitter, and central heating was not yet commonplace. Sarah Miles came over Connor Pass in a jeep, and there was heavy snow. She was frozen, she said, down in Fermile House. So she said she wanted a heater. I said, yeah. And I had one heater that was there more or less as a demonstration model, a super sir. She said, yes, that was perfect. Could I bring down ten to her this evening? Larry Hickey was a closing gas dealer, and I rang Larry. I said, Larry, I want ten Supercell heaters. He said, are you stone, man? Look, he said, I get back to you in the morning. Jeez, I said, she's looking for him this evening. And I was really putting pressure on him. So I found out after that there were three of them collected between Kilarglan and Carsevine. There was something like four got in Killarney and the rest were got in Tralee. <laughs> the job of finding props from the 1916 period fell to location and property manager Eddie Fowley. It hasn't really been a tremendous problem for me here in Ireland because uh, not on the west coast for the 1916 furnishings, but the, uh, the lorries were a bit of a problem because you can find vintage private cars but you can't find vintage lorries. Uh, and I searched all over Ireland. I had men going from top to bottom of Ireland looking for them. And mostly what we found were rotting away in fields and not available. But finally, I found some very good stuff. Uh, some of the best props I've ever had in that line, matter of fact. Having acquired the bits and pieces of the various vehicles, they then had to be assembled and made roadworthy. This was one of the tasks given to the special effects team under Bob MacDonald. Bob already had two Oscars, one for The Longest Stay and another for Ben Hur. No, I can't. You'll have to make a new key because the keys are yeah. With location, sets and props in place, one more ingredient was necessary before cameras started to roll. Scene extras. Actually, they came to the school from the wardrobe section and they just told us that to bring our old clothes and to bring a pair of Wellingtons with us and that they would be back the following day. And I remember I had a kind of a tartan dress and then I had a kind of a sack apron over it and we had black tights and kind of boots, lace-ups. So I think everybody's probably trying to 
be better than the next because we thought all of us wouldn't be chosen. But in actual fact, when they arrived back the following day, yeah, the whole school it was chosen. Robert Bull's screenplay was being constantly revised. The production schedule had the working title, Michael's Day. The original idea was to feature the village idiot as the main character. Gradually, Sarah Miles' Rosie Ryan gained the ascendancy. Perhaps not that surprising, as the screenwriter, Robert Bolt, was her husband. The other difficulty, of course, for confronting an Englishman dealing with the Irish is this vexed question of stage Irish. And um, it's surprising the number of Irishmen in this locality who have asked me uh, with some anxiety whether or not we had used stage Irish. Well, the answer is that if we have, we have done so very much by accident. We were very cognizant of this problem. The other answer is that if you dared to write down as dialogue, some of the dialogue which you will hear every day in the pubs round here, you would be laughed out of court. Certainly any English critic would say, but nobody talks like that. Uh, I do assure you that you, the Irish, do talk like that. Filming started on Ryan's Daughter on Monday, 24th of February, 1969. The circus had hit town with a bang. Everyone worked together towards a common goal, under Lean's direction, and with Freddie Young as cinematographer. Sorry about that, Hat. Hold it quiet, please, boy. Rolling. That's ready. Action. Robert Mitchum and his co-stars took to the task with enthusiasm. Former commercial traveller and veteran of nearly 80 films, John Mills relished the idea of his role. I enjoy playing this uh, extraordinarily grotesque part of Michael. Uh, it's uh, uncomfortable physically because I have to wear the most extraordinary teeth and things and ears and noses. But uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it more than anything I've done for a very long time. I mean, it's, a, it's an enormous challenge. It's very exciting. And, of course, I have no dialogue to learn at night because I, I don't speak, but it's, uh, it's a very exciting part to play. While shooting was taking place in Dune Queen, the film was being cut in Dingle by editor Norman Savage. Well, first of all, we screen it, you know, for Freddie Young, so he can see his camera lighting is fine, and then David sees him, he selects takes he prefers. You then, obviously, you talk with David about his intention behind the scene. A sequence like that, which is one of the most difficult sequences to cut, is to try and capture a mood. Nothing going on, no dialogue, nothing, just the noise of the ball. Boom, boom, boom. Could take up to a week to get it until we exactly say, that's it, we've got it. You know, you're doing nothing now. <laughs> you nothing to do. The stars of the film were paid handsomely. The budget, a reputed $15 million. Some of this did find its way into local pockets. It was two pounds a day, which would amount maybe to 10 pound a week. And sometimes you were working seven days. Now, other times you were there all day and you did nothing depending on the weather. So it was quite a nice pay packet to be getting at the end of the week. My mother kept it for us and for us only. You were properly treated all the time. The wages were £26 a week, that's what I was getting, about twice what you'd get normally. We got £13.6 and eightpence for Sunday, even if you only worked an hour. And um, there was overtime, there was time and a quarter, time and a half, and double time, and even treble time if you were working at night. She didn't have so, when you saw this, Robert Mitchum, I guess Sarah Miles, no revither, I don't know, me and the mother. She had no caution, the 
un tas ko komont mar vis da chapa do gros rog ach da vi berte hoko er far vi os chum che rif hit blin aga son son chin mar bunyu khusa de sanason vi en chandne aga so vai dige komont nasil aga sno pakai er glau And there was more. Early in the shoot, the producers needed a stand-in for one of the actors. An approach was made to Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, you can do me a big favour. I never said. He said, can you start filming with us tomorrow morning? I said, you must be joking, boy. Look, he said, Pedro and David have said, you're perfect. I said, who David? David Lean. So to make a long story short, I said no. I said, I'm only married a couple of months, my wife is pregnant, it'll be war. I came home anyway and I said to Bridie, you wouldn't believe this Bridie, I said. She said, what? Would you believe if they wanted me to go work in the film tomorrow? Don't tell me she said you're going. With the business and everything, my hands are full. Would you get paid? I said he told me I'd get the same pay as the other stand-ins and that their pay at that time was £96 a week. You know, Tom, she said, I suppose you could go for a couple of days anyway. <laughs> While the work ethic was exemplary and safety standards were rigorously observed, when things did go wrong, a little local knowledge could go a long way. Quiet, please, everybody, quiet. They were trying to get Trevor Howard and um, John Mills, in other words, the, the, the idiot in the village and, and uh, the priest, to come in in the waves in the canoe. As communal is fairly wavy, the advice was ignored, you do not put a curragh or a nave oak in there, but they did. And then the whole thing set up that they had um, a wire going out, a pulley outside, so that in actual fact it wasn't the boys rowing at all. It was the wires pulling the canoe in and out. The tide went out, and as it does in common all very quickly, and it, the curragh beached. Something went wrong with one of the wires, it snagged or something. And then you had a wave that turned it over, and then you had a second, a third wave, and before you knew it, they were in six feet of water. And Mills and Trevor Howard were under the canoe, and they were trying to lift it up, and I sure I nearly got slapped when I stuck my leg through the, the canvas. I, I knew that it would leave in a bit of air and lifted the canoe. It was several hours I got a hold of. Uh, Roy Stevens had, had, had John Mills, and they were both fairly well shook up, in all fairness to them now. Nurse Noreen Curran was summoned. Unfortunately, John Mills hit his head off one of the seats under the boat. Trevor was able to stand up, so there was chaos at that stage. They were all running around. And so I just made sure his airways were clear and tucked out some water. And then we, he did have something in his head, I think, put a, possibly a band-aid or something with a bit of uh, disinfectant. Mark Kerry had trained as a waiter in Dublin's Royal Hibernian Hotel. He was now headhunted by the Skelligs Hotel to cater to Lean and company. The only thing about David Lean was what he asked for he got. You went away with it in your head and you just went into the kitchen and said, this is what he wants. It could be plover, it could be some type of duck, it could be patty to foie gras, it could be oysters. When there's no oysters going anyplace else, 
and probably the most exotic thing that I ever had anything to do with was Indian water buffalo for David Lean. We had a system where we could order two Harrods in London and they never asked, ever once, what would something cost or whatever. It was, if you could get it, get it. 